So I'll be discussing the theory of growth in Schumpeter and Marx. So uh, to start with, I'll just mention what uh, what I've read. So what uh, this talk is based on, uh, on the side of Joseph Schumpeter, 1883 to 1950. I've only read uh, the theory of economic development uh, published in 1934. On the side of Karl Marx, 1818 to 1883, I will base uh, my comments mostly on Das Kapital, uh, but I've read a lot of other things by Marx and Engels, which uh, will inform uh, my presentation. First, I'll compare uh, the methodology of these two economists, uh, then discuss uh, equilibrium or the, the cycle of revenue, CMC, commodity, money, commodity, uh, then growth. So uh, MCM, using Marx's term, uh, the, the circuit of capital. Uh, within that, then uh, a number of subtopics come up, including how we define capital, what is capital, how do we conceptualize it, uh, how do we define profit, what is it, uh, what's our theory of profit. So in terms of overall methodology, one thing I was struck by was that Schumpeter follows Marx in ascending from the abstract to the concrete, uh, which is to say that there are a number of more or less explicit assumptions that are known to be false in order to simplify the problem analytically. And then uh, those assumptions are relaxed one by one. Uh, and then we see how well does the theory so far developed um, function under these more uh, concrete, realistic uh, circumstances. Like Marx, for Schumpeter, it's important to distinguish surface phenomena from essence. This is not true necessarily of all economists. So uh, in particular, the neoclassical economists or what Marx calls the vulgar economists are content with taking the analytical concepts that arise naturally by participants in an economy as the ones that are needed for theory. And then like uh, Marx, Schumpeter's presentation divides cleanly into two parts, which are also the two parts of my presentation. Uh, using uh, Marx's terminology, the circuit of revenue, commodity, money, commodity, and the circuit of capital, money, commodity, money. Uh, and uh, for Schumpeter, these, the first one is called the circular flow. And I'm not sure that he has an explicit term for the second, but it's a, it's an, it's a growing economy. Okay, so uh, first, Schumpeter's circular flow collapses uh, what in Marx are are two analytical uh, constructs. So one is simple commodity production, which comes up uh, in uh, Capital Volume 1, and one is simple reproduction, which comes up in Volume 2. So I'll just say a, a word about those. In simple commodity production, we're only looking at uh, circulation. So this is where uh, owners of commodities meet in the market and exchange equivalent for equivalent. In uh, simple reproduction, instead, we're looking at those circumstances under which a economic system is able to reproduce itself from one cycle to another. And that includes, for instance, ratios of uh, outputs in uh, what Marx calls department one, which produces uh, producer goods, means of production, and department two, uh, the Part of the economy that produces uh, consumption goods for the, uh, for consumers. Uh, for Marx, simple commodity production is a much more abstract analytical step right at the beginning of his uh, presentation. It's not clear at that point that profit is even possible. And in simple reproduction, we have a uh, economy where the capitalist's uh, consumption needs are supported by uh, their profit, but it's not a growing economy uh, and there's no technological change. So the reason that Schumpeter is able to collapse these two constructs of Marx is because he lacks an exploitation theory of profit. So, so Marx needs to distinguish, you know, the very simple case in which there's no profit uh, from the case in which there's profit but no growth, uh, whereas Schumpeter doesn't see Profit is possible in a stagnant economy. Uh, for Schumpeter, it's only because of growth that there is profit because he lacks the exploitation theory of profit. 
And the reason why he lacks the exploitation theory of profit is because he uses a subjective theory of value rather than Marx's labor theory of value. All right, so now I turn to MCM, the circuit of capital, the growing economy. And then uh, just to remind you, I will cover capital theory, profit theory, and credit theory. So how do our two authors define capital? Before going into that, I think it's helpful to remind ourselves what Schumpeter's teacher, Bumbaverk, says. So according to Bumbaverk, capital is basically just another word for what Marx calls means of production. For Schumpeter, capital is the means of payment in the hands of an entrepreneur. That is to say, money when an entrepreneur has it. For Marx, capital is self-valorizing value, and uh, what that means for him uh, will become a little bit more clear when I compare uh, him and Schumpeter in more detail. So Schumpeter's definition of capital is very close to Marx's, but where Marx sees the whole MCM cycle as itself capital, Schumpeter sees only the two M's as capital but not the C. So let me just say a word about what that means. So for Marx, a capitalist starts with some money, then buys means of production and labor power with that money, then brings uh, those means of production and labor power together in the production process, then creates uh, commodities from that combination, and then sells those commodities. And if everything has worked, uh, the sale of the commodities at the end of the production process gets the capitalist more money uh, than he started with at the beginning of the process. That voyage of a certain amount of money to becoming a larger amount of money is capital, and every form taken by the value of that cycle is also capital. Whereas uh, for Schumpeter, the entrepreneur's capital, it's just the money and uh, the means of production uh, and labor power is something else. So he, he has his capital, he invests his capital, then he gets capital back from the production process. So uh, largely a terminological difference. Now, I, I do think it's intriguing that uh, for Bumba Verk, Schumpeter's teacher, only the C is capital, only means of production is capital. Whereas for Schumpeter, it's it's the M on either side of the C that's capital. So they have distinct opposite even and yet compatible understandings of what capital is. So now I think I've said enough about capital and I'll turn to profit. First, profit for Marx, which is substantially more complicated than uh, profit for Schumpeter. So I beg your patience. Marx distinguishes three kinds of profit, profit of alienation, profit of exploitation, and surplus profit, which for reasons of parallelism, I will call profit of differential innovation. Now, the distinction between profit of alienation and profit of exploitation, he takes from Sir James Stewart, 1712 to 1780. I will read two quotes from Stewart that are quoted by uh, Marx in Theories of Surplus Value. In the price of goods, I consider two things are really existing and quite different from another, the real value of the commodity and the profit upon alienation. Positive profit implies no loss to anybody. It results from an augmentation of labor, industry, or ingenuity and has the effect of swelling or augmenting the public good. Relative profit which is the same as his profit of alienation, is what implies a loss to somebody. It makes a vibration of the balance of wealth between parties, but implies no addition to the general stock. So any time that uh, someone sells something for more than its value, they are accruing profit of alienation. For those you know, who care about such things, in the so-called transformation problem, when a capital receives a higher profit than it would be entitled to in virtue of its contribution of surplus value to the social pool of surplus value, 
uh, which comes because of its uh, higher organic composition of capital, that is also profit of alienation. They're, they're just taking surplus value from other uh, pr- producers. Uh, now, if that sounds like a mass of gobbledygook, it's because uh, you haven't been uh, looking into uh, the technicalities of Marxist economics. And uh, and now is not the place uh, to go into that. So I just mentioned that for uh, for those people for whom it means something. This distinction between profit of alienation and profit of, of exploitation is essential to Marx. It's his starting point in simple commodity production that profit of alienation can arise in exchange, but there's no way for there to be profit at the social level through profit of alienation. So there must be another source of profit that happens in the production process, and that's profit of exploitation. So the characteristics of profit of alienation are that it does not contribute to the wealth of society, and that it's characteristic of merchants' capital and of finance capital, both two forms of capital that existed before capitalism and continue to exist today. Both uh, merchants and finance receive profit without contributing to the wealth of society. So now profit of exploitation, this is what Marx is most famous for. Uh, It is surplus value. That is the value of the surplus product, the price of the part of production that does not sustain the laborer. Surplus labor is performed by the proletariat and it's characteristic of industrial capital. The difference between the value produced by the working class and the value that uh, the working class receives in their sale of their labor power to capital, uh, that difference is a surplus value, and that is the source of uh, profit of exploitation. Okay, now the third type of profit, profit of uh, differential innovation, this is what Marx calls uh, surplus profit. It is the advantage that accrues to early adopters of labor-saving technology or the providers of new commodities. When uh, a new productive technique comes in that lowers unit costs, in particular lowers unit labor inputs, then that firm can undersell other companies in order to uh, gain market share. And they will only slightly undersell in order to have as high a profits as possible, even though their costs are substantially different. So the difference between the socially necessary labor time that is set by the overall productive conditions in that sector of the economy and the firm individual level necessary labor time, that difference allows that firm to charge more than their costs and more than average profits. And that additional profit that accrues to them, that surplus profit, that's profit of differential innovation. Marx doesn't talk much about the introduction of new commodities. He focuses on this process of lowering unit labor inputs. But it's uh, it's clear that in the case of introducing uh, a new commodity, the mechanism is similar. In that case, initially, there is no market price. So the first producer to market gets to set a monopoly price. Society only figures out what the value determined price is once there's a competitive market for it. And and in that time that it takes for the market to fill up, uh, the monopolist gets to have a above average profit uh, on that uh, commodity. And that is profit of differential innovation as well. Now, profit of differential innovation is only short term because as uh, either other producers start making the new commodity or other producers start using the increasingly efficient productive technique, the profit of differential innovation is eroded. Uh, It seems to me that profit of differential innovation is a subtype of uh, profit of alienation, uh, but uh, I just leave that as a comment.
So now I look at profit in Schumpeter, uh, much simpler. All profit for Schumpeter is profit of differential innovation. Schumpeter's much simpler theory of profit, uh, again, emanates from his value theory and his theory of growth. There cannot be profit for him in a stagnant economy. So that's basically where he abstracts from um, profit of exploitation. In equilibrium, where supply and demand are in balance, just like for Marx, there can't be profit of alienation. It's only when you get technological innovation that you get profit for Schumpeter, and that's uh, this profit of differential innovation. So now I'll talk just a bit more about surplus profit, that's profit of differential innovation, and its relationship to technological innovation. Both Schumpeter and Marx emphasize that uh, technological innovation yields these surplus profits in the short term, uh, but only Marx emphasizes the compulsion to introduce technological innovation in order to reduce the wage bill. So for Schumpeter, there's a kind of ex machina component to entrepreneurs. An entrepreneur shows up, is aware that some uh, opportunity exists, and then creates profit by uh, seeing that opportunity through. Whereas uh, for Marx, the competitive environment of capitalism forces companies to innovate. If you don't strike first, uh, then someone else will uh, beat you and take your market share. So the only way to protect your market share is to be constantly trying uh, to reduce costs. One major difference between these two thinkers has to do with the general rate of profit. So for Marx, the general rate of profit is the price of the surplus product produced by surplus labor divided by the total social capital. So the question is, how much profit is there in the whole society? And that is a, is a function of how much exploitation there is in the whole society and how much capital investment there is in the, in the, in the whole society. So uh, all of the capitalists look and they say, okay, I've been able to exploit this much labor using this much upfront payment. That's the general profit rate. Uh, but for Schumpeter, all profit is surplus profit, which is locally determined. So there is no general rate of profit. There's no, there's no mechanism uh, by which a general rate of profit in society could be established. There's only like local fleeting pockets of profit. So now on to the famous law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. And one interesting point in common between these two thinkers is that they both have a form of this law. Although this law is famously associated with Marx, uh, Smith and Ricardo have it as well, and it seems so does Schumpeter. So both Marx and Schumpeter think that the profit rate has a tendency to fall. For Schumpeter, this is because there are no profits in the circular flow. Unless you get an entrepreneur who's introducing an innovation, which then leads to a local uh, profit of differential innovation, a surplus profit, then there's no profit. The default at the social level is a zero profit rate. And it's only entrepreneurs coming and introducing innovations that kind of keeps the profit rate above zero. Uh, and that's always a local phenomenon. Those profits are always eroded through competition. So um, it's a struggle against the fall in the rate of profit for Schumpeter. So for Marx, there is a positive profit rate at the social level, as I just discussed earlier, the amount of exploitation at the social level divided by the amount of capital invested at the social level. But for Marx, because of increasing labor productivity, the amount of living, living labor that a certain amount of capital is able to set in motion is always decreasing over time. So then the ratio of uh, exploited living labor to upfront capital costs uh, is always going down. And, and that process of technological innovation in, in terms of increasing labor productivity is what drives the profit rate down. So the question naturally arises, if there is this tendency for the rate of profit to fall, does that lead necessarily to the end of capitalism as a form of 
social economic organization. If we look at Schumpeter, he does not appear to foresee such a breakdown as long as there are entrepreneurs. It seems possible that as more and more entrepreneurial opportunities are addressed by entrepreneurs, it becomes harder to become an entrepreneur, harder to find new innovations, new products. But Schumpeter doesn't really address that possibility explicitly. So I think let's uh, go with that he imagines a supply of entrepreneurs will be indefinitely available, and there's no reason to foresee the end of capitalism. Now, for Marx, this is an extremely controversial question and depends essentially on whether capital is sufficiently devalued during a crisis. So let me just uh, talk that through a little bit. The thing that's driving the profit rate down is that the uh, ratio of living labor to capital invested up front goes down over time as labor productivity increases, as I described uh, before. Now, if in a crisis, you have to write down uh, the means of production to a great extent, then uh, that will reopen the possibility for another round of capital accumulation. And the question is, is that process of destroying the value of existing capital during a crisis, uh, is that process sufficient to start things over again? Or do you start at a, a higher level where uh, even though the profit rate recovers a bit, it doesn't recover enough? Heinrich Grossman is the theorist who most powerfully puts forward the hypothesis that it is Marx's view that uh, the profit rate decreases even across the cycle of uh, boom and bust. So sticking with the law of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, I want to address the role of the entrepreneur in these two competing theorists. So for Schumpeter, the entrepreneur raises the profit rate by making surplus profit in the first place. There would be no profit without the entrepreneur. He pays bankers and does other things that uh, potentially uh, moves that surplus profit around in the economy. And that's the only reason why anyone else has any profit. Whereas for Marx, the entrepreneur lowers the profit rate by reducing unit costs. Schumpeter emphasizes new products whereas Marx emphasizes cheaper products of the same quality. And I think that that difference largely accounts for the difference of emphasis. Commodifying something new, uh, I think, does counteract the tendency for the rate of profit to fall, whereas making an existing commodity cheaper uh, accelerates the rate of the profit falling. 